Support for this podcast comes from Frito-Lay in the 2023 Snack Bracket Championship. The Frito-Lay Snack It Challenge is underway, and fans are voting on their favorite snacks to crown champion. We're talking about primetime matchups between the best 64 snacks in the land. Will Ruffles Ridges reign supreme? Can Doritos defend their dynasty? Or will Smart Food use their smarts for a surprise upset? Only you can decide. Get in on all the action for a chance to win up to $1,000 or a year's worth of snacks. Let your snacks be heard. Just go to frito to vote and enter for a chance to win. No purchase necessary. Three stakes ends April 3rd, 2023. Void but prohibited. Years worth of snacks awarded in the form of 52 coupons, each good for one bag of chips. See official rules at frito Hello, Mavs fans. It's Kirk Henderson and Josh Bowe. We're back to you after a unexpected hiatus due to the kind of catastrophic weather events there in Texas. I am uh, back with co-host Josh Bowe, who has power again. Thank goodness. Josh, how are you? I am good. I, uh, I am much better off than a lot of other people, so I'm, I am very thankful. We have power. House didn't House pipes didn't burst. Everything's actually pretty good, all things considered. So... Uh, let's do this. Um, it, we there was a Mavericks game. We we there can was talk a about a Mavericks game. <laughs> what do we think of said Mavericks game? Where they escape with a uh, escape is a strong term. They led wire to wire one hundred two to ninety two. I just I have no idea how to feel about this game. Uh, it was a very bizarre game because I think I made this note that in the first half, yes, in the first half. Tim Hardaway Jr., Jalen Brunson, and Josh Richardson combined for 41 of the Mavericks' 54 first half points. Uh, Luca and Dwight Powell were the only other Mavericks besides that trio to make a shot in the first half. So it was a really bizarre game. Uh, Luca really didn't do much of anything in the first half. I think he had seven points in the first half. Uh, and the other, those three guys were on fire. Richardson made his first three shots, and the Brunson. Hardaway bench lineups were massive in that first half. They were just on fire from from basically start to finish for the most part. And I think once Dallas got a, a double digit lead in the first quarter, I mean they were they were up double digits all the way to the final buzzer. Which Kirk, I don't remember the last time this team has done that. Um, it's been a long time, and I kind of felt a little oddly reassured watching this game because I think. You shared similar sentiments, but the beginning of this game in the first quarter, uh, really up until Brunson and Hardaway uh, started going off, I was kind of like, the Mavericks aren't really playing all that well, but they're up like 15. And it was kind of nice because, you know, that to me, that's usually like, you know, that's usually what good teams sometimes do against, you know, poor teams or or teams that they're better than is they just kind of find a way to win these games uh, even when they're not necessarily having their best or most efficient night. And I thought that was kind of cool in a way. And obviously that doesn't mean it was a perfect game. You know, there was some some weird things uh, in terms of what some of the other guys did on the floor. Uh, but I'm, you know, pretty satisfied after eight games off. Uh, and the fact that the Mavericks don't get a lot of double-digit wins, I'll take it. Yeah, I think that probably is is the thing that that, you you might have kind of hit my sense of unease where I didn't really feel much for this game in the sense that I kind of kept waiting for the other shoe to drop and it just never really did. And it's nice to have an uneventful win where you can look at, you know, you can look at it, it essentially the hot shooting, the 48 points from Brunson and Hardaway and then a nice start from Richardson and that, was essentially enough. Um, And then the rest of the lineup had a fairly ranging from nondescript to, you know, your Maxi Kleba, you know, 2.5 rebound, but plus 13 uh, outing to Luka Doncic's 8 for 18, 21.7 rebound, 5 assists, slog fest. It was like for for the Luka aspect is probably the ugliest game I can remember him having this season. Uh, there might be one that's just slipping my mind, but it felt like uh, over the break, I talked with Seth Partnow and he talked about how it felt like Luca was very labored. That felt like a labored game. I don't 
I don't know why. I don't really know what to put my fingers on other than the fact that the Mavericks just didn't look right for, uh, not the Mavericks, just Luka. And so it's, you know, it, it's nice to to escape from, from a win w- in that respect. Yeah, and I think uh, to to elaborate on that point, you might be onto something because I was watching, after the game, I was watching the Mavericks broadcast and they interviewed, uh, the broadcast crew interviewed Josh Richardson and they talked, they asked him, you know, how are you guys able, how did that first quarter feel after, you know, not being, you know, not being in a game for over eight days, which is like, which really is crazy. Uh, you know, all-star breaks aren't even that long. So it was probably the longest break a team will ever get uh in the middle of the season um yeah. and so they asked him like how did you you know what what was that like you know what was the first quarter like uh and he was like you know you know got to be honest you know basically we kind of hit a wall to start the game because we, we were just tired because you know we just haven't you know they've been practicing but as as former players and current players will tell you you know nba practices just do not replicate uh, the amount of energy that it requires to be played in a, in a real competitive regular season game. And Richardson was like, you know, up until like the first time out, you know, we were all kind of, we were kind of tired hitting a wall. And then he said, once we got through that, we kind of pushed past it and we felt like we got our legs and you could kind of tell, you know, in the second quarter, that's kind of when they started to make their run a little bit, uh, at least offensively. So maybe there was something to that and they just kind of needed some time to get into the game. And Luca had a much better second half, so you know, uh, I was very worried about them losing this game, and then everyone being like, "Ah, oh, they haven't played in eight days; they're just rusty." And mm-hmm. I'm like, guys, we, <laughs> the only storyline we've been talking about is how many games they're playing and how they don't get any rest. So don't don't give me that. But, right? Uh, maybe, but maybe there is something at least to it in terms of like the start of the game, which was very disjointed, uh, and then the Mavericks looked way better, you know, for the last you know three quarters of the game for the most part. Yeah, and and so so I, I just don't really. I, I will say that that their defensive communication felt better. There was there was a lot more active hands. Josh Richardson was sort of doing his deal, which I hadn't really remembered seeing in a while. He guarded John ja Morant a lot. You know, they they did a nice job with John ja until probably the, I don't know, midway through the third quarter when when they just kind of started coasting. But it was it was an interesting kind of performance. You know, with Porzingis being out due to uh, whatever reason they decided to not play him on, which I don't really believe he has any back issues. They talked about how he has been dealing with something all season in the pregame. And if that's the case, then there should be like five alarm fires going off. I just feel like they looked at their record on back to backs and decided they weren't going to push it. Uh, I don't want to talk about KP too much because there's just not much to say, but I think that the, the, the backline communication with these guys in terms of what happens on drives, the Mavericks just looked a little bit better. And I don't know if that's because the Grizzlies just aren't great. Um, you know, the Grizzlies, I watched the Grizzlies broadcast and they pointed out that the Mavericks have, and I think I knew this, but we just don't talk about it a lot because it's an excuse. The Mavericks have the toughest to date, the toughest schedule in the NBA, where their opponents, who they've played so far, have a 53% win percentage, which is the best uh, for out of any, you know, the hardest out of any team that that's played in the uh, so far in the league. And so it's 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 just it's interesting because I, I want to be I want to be hopeful, but I also think that there's you know things that we've kind of dove into the data. They played 28 games prior to to tonight. And there were there have been wild swings in certain things which are frankly beyond their control. The first, I think it was as Taco pointed out, the first five or six games, the Mavericks had one of the best three-point shooting defenses in the league. Well, three-point shooting defense is not a thing because it's about like wide open shots where the Maver- like teams were shooting 31% on wide open shots against Mavericks. And then the last like 15, 18 games, something like that, teams have been shooting. 42 percent on open threes against the Mavs and then tonight either the Grizzlies are bad at three-point shooting which there's like that one take from Winslow that was like an air ball from the right side a corner that just missed the rim entirely is kind of horrifying uh, there's just like there's in this small like a weird season I just don't know what to, to make of these these things because I don't think the Mavericks are great at defense I also don't think that they're as bad as they've been showing so it's it's going to be interesting to see how they play against the Celtics tomorrow night who are kind of in their own, you know, batch of quicksand. 
Yeah, and it it was maybe it was a just a perfect combination of they got four or five practices in a row in which I imagine they used a lot to work on defense and getting to gel with each other and and communicate and talk more on the floor. You would hope, uh, combined with the fact that this Grizzlies team is missing some guys. And man, Kirk, you look at their lineup. And outside of John Morant, you know what perimeter player on this team uh, in this in their current form scares you? Like you know, Grayson Allen's playing twenty five minutes. Yeah, Dylan Brooks is good. People yeah. people don't realize this. That dude is is ah uh, good might be strong, but he he's adds crucial the element. for them. He, yeah. He's he's like their Tim Hardaway Jr. element of kind of X factor guy. Yeah, like. Th- they're a much easier team to guard without, you know, it's basically your John Morant, Valanciunas pick and rolls. And, and, and then you're kind of, the other guys are like good, solid, like role players, but kind of like on the Maverick side, they're just kind of spot up ball movers, not necessarily guys that are going to threaten your defense. And so Mm -hmm. that helps because I don't think that there was, you know, something that I think the Mavericks have struggled with has been pick and roll defense. And we've talked about drop coverage and stuff. Well, the Grizzlies didn't, you know, the Grizzlies didn't necessarily have a, a threatening, pick and roll attack tonight and they didn't have to necessarily worry about blow buys because you know the guys that they're guarding aren't necessarily you know huge creators off the dribble you know i mean you could i mean i'm looking at this grizzlies lineup and you know the their their third best scorer is probably the rookie desmond bain right now uh mm-hmm. after morant and valanchunas and that's you know that's a boon so i think this was a good team for the mavericks to kind of beat up on uh because they are struggling offensively but i also think you're right and there was it was a little crisper uh defensively it didn't seem like there were so many like the thing that's been crazy about this month is it's not just you know maybe a run of bad luck or bad defense but just like kind of like catastrophic defensive meltdown quarters uh i've been keeping track uh, in the month of february and the mavericks have given up a lot of 35 plus point quarters which is no good uh so the fact that the grizzlies uh through three quarters had the most they put up was 26 like you could tell that the mistakes were the volume of mistakes were kept to a minimum uh, and it helps, you know, like I said, it helps playing against this Memphis team. Uh, it's probably easier to not commit defensive snafus against them when you've got, like you said, Justice Winslow uh, shooting air ball threes out of the corner. Uh, that certainly helps, but uh, credit to the Mavs, you know, it helps, but credit to the Mavs for kind of taking it and running with it and winning by double digits. Well, and and now, you know, we're, we're at this very interesting point where you said at the beginning of February, which is somehow three weeks ago, that the Mavericks really need to aim to be at 500 by the time they go to All-Star break. There's, I think, five games left before All-Star break. They're one game under 500 with a you, – I, I'm very – I'm, I'm going to be very interested to see how they play. The Celtics are a good team who, frankly, on paper, match up against them very well. Uh, the the Brooklyn Nets are a, a firestorm of offense that is not great at defense. The Sixers, we might as well just – that that's the <laughs> Thursday game. That's going to be tough. If they win that game, then we should be super excited. I'm going to do my dangest not to get super upset over that game because Joel Embiid is looking like like the, the destroyer of worlds that people have assumed he could be for a while. So we're just kind of in a – you know, it would have been great to play those games. You know, I don't – but with where they are now moving forward, I'm in a pretty ambivalent to almost positive outlook at the moment. Um, they yeah, they well, needed some things to go right. Yeah. And the, the, to be quite frank, you know, the excuses are, you know, not that they were, I mean, excuses is such a loaded term, depending on how you use it. Like, but the, the reasons for their disappointing start are mostly behind them. Uh, So that's what was kind of nice about, I mean, obviously you don't want the reason to miss a week to be a catastrophic weather event uh, in your home state, but I mean, it happened and they got the games off. And I think a lot of what you could attribute to them struggling has been, you know, COVID and guys running a little weary and, and, and not getting enough rest and, and being affected by the virus and having the rotation being thin for almost, you know, almost half the season. So like everyone's healthy, uh, obviously, you know, Chris Stops didn't play, but you know, I think that was more of a, we have to pick which game he's not going to play in this back to back. And they picked the easier game. Uh, so, you know, it's kind of like everyone's healthy. You just got 
basically two i mean all-star break is like what five like five days like they got two all almost two all-star breaks in a row uh Aaron, everyone's basically healthy you know maxi sprained an ankle late uh hopefully he that is not a long-term issue uh everyone's rested you got practice time in you basically got a gift you know we've been talking like you were talking about how the mavericks haven't gotten a break all season you know talk about how some of the covid teams have had multiple games postponed the mavericks only got one game postponed uh well they just that it kind of got paid forward yeah. last week in a, in a weird way so i'm not trying to be like uh too critical but it's it's sort of i wrote about this earlier today. it's it's time like it's time to see the team that we thought this team could be in the preseason and in the off season when they made their acquisitions and i think tonight was a decent start of that you know solid josh richardson game really good jalen brunson you know really good tim hardaway jr you know winning a game without luca having to to do everything which is what we were hoping would be part of the blueprint and some of their wins this season when they made the moves they made last you know uh in october and september november so so far so good and these next three games man boston philly brooklyn that'll that'll be a real test to see where this team is at and where they need to go well i don't really got much more uh, <laughs> yeah. we got I four mean, games this week <laughs> it's kind of nice and there's no i mean they had a basically a double digit lead for the whole game and nothing crazy happened like it was just it was it was a game that the Mavericks won. These this was this felt a little bit more like last season Mavericks in the sense of like when that team was on a roll last year, they were kind of banking some really good wins against uh, you know, substandard opponents. Not that the Grizzlies are a terrible team, but you know what I mean. Sure. Not, against the non elite teams, they basically took care of business last year. The Mavericks did. So to to kind of show a little bit of that, some more uh, was nice, and the fact that they didn't necessarily do it because they were molten lava lot, m- molten lava hot for on offense the whole game uh, was nice. Like uh, they haven't won a game like this in February, really. Uh, so it, it was a good development, but they got we got to see what's going to happen tomorrow. Yeah. Oh yeah. Well, this has been Josh and Kirk on uh, Mavs Moneyball After Dark. We will be back tomorrow night after the Boston game. So everybody have a good day. Today's episode is brought to you by Cars.com. With over 2 million vehicles and 50,000 more added every day, Cars.com will match you with the perfect car for you, your budget, your life, your style. And if you're ready to say goodbye to your current car, Cars.com will get you an instant offer to cash it in. Just start by entering your license plate and get matched with a local dealer who will write you the check. So whether you're looking to buy or sell, Just go to cars.com. It's magical. Guys, so we just got out of the, uh, I just finished recording with Josh in our podcast, and I'm not really ready to go to bed yet. I should probably do some writing or hop on Xbox Live or something, but uh, I figured I'd uh, turn this on while I was uh, editing and talk to you guys. So, uh, hey, Grant, what's happening? I think we all would have known what happened if uh, Jaron played tonight. I think that's fair. I really, <laughs> I really enjoy watching that guy play basketball. Tell us what in the world's going on with him, in case people aren't really familiar. So I know he had a more. So Kristaps's tear on his meniscus was classified as minor. Jaron was supposed to be back at the beginning of this month, at the end of last month, but I, I don't think anything happened. I don't think it was a setback. They just decided. You know, they had a COVID scare. They missed a few games. I think they just decided, like, hey, let's, you know, wait till after the All-Star break. But as far as I, I talked to the host of Locked on Grizzlies, and he said right after All-Star break is when he, he'll be back. So hopefully that uh, stays true. Yeah, I mean, they're playing 500 basketball right now, which is, is a, a kind of the goal, I think, for the Mavericks at the moment, too, in the sense of you just sort of want to make it to where – if you're in play for one of these playoff positions, you know, basically top 10, then you you can kind of see where you are. And, and if you don't need to have that guy, which the Grizzlies haven't, uh, they probably could have used him tonight. Uh, yeah, it's, it's a bit of a luxury if you can get him going. Um, so, yeah, I mean, that was kind of a... That was a terrible game. Am I the only, like, am I the only person who thought that? It, it was just awful to watch. Uh, I don't think Tim Hardaway Jr. agrees with you. 
Well, uh, I mean, uh, hard to watch. Yeah, I'll, I'll I'll give you that. But I mean, uh, you you hopped into Dalton Dalton's uh, locker room right when it started to get bad, and that's when I I hopped off because I was like, oh no, I need to watch this just in case we blow it. It really did feel like one of those games because the Mavericks. You know, it, it, the first wire to wire win, I think, since early January, and it might have been maybe the fifth time all year that they've done that, which when you say all year and they played 29 games, that's actually pretty good. But it's just, it's just <laughs> my brain is like tuned to be concerned about the Mavericks yep. giving up uh, late leads. The one that the one that will haunt me, even though it was a victory, was the game where Luca was injured against the uh, the Bucks. Where Giannis almost oh, yeah. like single handedly brought them back, <laughs> like no, that just tough. plays in my head. Well, I I don't have much time to talk, but I I I did want to talk about Jaron for a second. You mentioned uh, you like you like him watching watching him play basketball uh, during the game today. I was actually informed that I will be in attendance tomorrow to watch my other favorite player, Jalen Brown. Mm probably demolish us yeah jalen brown the the player who would probably pair most perfectly with luca um, yeah he's he he's the most efficient player who does not have the ball in his hands at all times like hands down oh yeah he does he does nothing you know he could he could you know use a better handle and a better uh, eye for playmaking but he doesn't other than those two things he does nothing short of perfect in the in the rest of his game i, I love him so much well, thank you for joining. You go be good, yeah. and we will uh, we'll talk with one of these, you know, another night. Yeah. Um, oh shoot! Didn't mean to kill you, Grant. I was just gonna say I'll see you on uh, Sea of Thieves. I'll be I'll be playing the. Uh... <laughs> I'm playing... trolling What's... me about Sea of Thieves. What's All right, man. Goes... You have a good night. <laughs> All right. Taylor, how's it going? Oh, can you hear me? It's my oh, first yeah. time using this. Oh, well, first off, man, big fan, so thanks for having me. Sure, it's this, a cool app. It really is, man. Um, so on this point about giving up these late leads, it, we're such a jump shot, jump shot dependent team right now that we come out hot and gangbusters in the first half. If we're not getting the line consistently down the stretch, it's just a matter of time as the as our like st- inevitably streaky shooters cool off. That it's just like you know a race against time to see if we can run out the clock before these leads kind of evaporate. And to me, that's just a lot of, you know, we're just, we're going to, you know, such a cliche to say it's a make or miss league, but like with our, with our construction, especially if Luca's getting to the line and not converting like he was tonight, which was, you know, wild in its own way. Um, that's like, that's what always scares me down the stretch, especially when we start out hot. Cause I know I just, in the back of my mind, it's like the, the swoon is coming, you know? Felt the same way in the first quarter when I watched Richardson just rain Richardson and Tim rating threes. I was like, oh, this is going to come back to bite the Mavericks in a really bad way at a really bad time. And it just never did, which, uh, mm-hmm. you know, I just recorded the podcast with Josh and I talked about, just, yeah, I'm not used to that feeling. It was, it yeah. was nice to kind of get a wire to wire win. I will say the thing that I, I, I wish that I could see some progress on, and I don't know how we would ever actually be able to see progress on this. Is if mm-hmm. the Mavericks, when when teams are sending a double at Luca, uh, you know, to try to get the ball out of his hands in those situations, mm-hmm. I, I never feel like it's going to end well. And the Mavericks did okay tonight. I mean, I did want to eject Dwight Powell into mm-hmm. the sun when he committed an offensive foul on the baseline late, but like other than that, it was, it was pretty fun. Yeah, and I think I think there's a lot of there's a lot more decisiveness in that area um, across the board today, and I think we we have also as I mentioned to my Ruben sitting here watching again, Brunson and he's been playing so well, but he's been playing a lot more decisive. Um, yeah, and like well, we can all we can all get a little frustrated with his like, you know, he's got his one on one moves and everything, but he can get so methodical in a way that like, if we're gonna be playing this slow. We really only want Luca to be doing it, mm-hmm. you know, and otherwise we need the ball to be popping and get some life so we can try to, you know, get our other guys who can't really attack set defenses, you know, seeing guys moving up towards them and be able to tack off, you know, off balanced uh, closeouts and stuff of that nature. I just think it just, I, hopefully the practice this week helped kind of like get these guys in a, in a flow with each other, moving the ball and popping it around and stuff. 
They had to do something because we did. Uh, I do think their defense at least looked a little more awake. I'm not sure if it was more effective because mm-hmm. the Grizzlies were just breaking shots. Yeah. Um, thanks, thanks for joining yeah. me, Taylor. Uh, thanks I for having me, man. Something that so so last night on the call we had Jason who is in the chat right now basically raise a question of you know Luca's burst and. It was really tonight was a really great example, I think, of Luca just looking like he was playing in quicksand. Uh, he was kind of screwing around at parts of the second where I think he was kind of looking for a shot in an attempt to try to get some threes to go down. Where he finally didn't kind of start the quarter, but that might have been Luca's like that felt like a a performance that if I was a Luca hater, I would want to point to that game because he he sort of. He still finished with like 21, seven and five, but it was labored. It was inefficient. It was just, it was pretty painful to me. I, I was, uh, you know, found myself like increasingly frustrated, particularly after I'd spent, you know, a better portion of the week arguing with, you know, friends, you know, people on our, on our comments about how Luca is like, Luca is the far superior player to Porzingis. Then he comes out and looks like that tonight, which, you know, that, that, that kind of is what it is. Um, does anybody else have any more questions? Because I just kind of wanted to, to ramble for a bit. I should go to sleep. I have to get up in like six hours. But, you know, who wants to sleep when you can argue and talk about basketball friends? Let's see if we got any questions in the chat. No, not so far. Well, you know, I'm probably going to uh, attempt to do these maybe after some games. Depends on how much editing duties and things I have to do. For, for Mavs Moneyball, um, we have, you know, a number of posts that were up uh, today that came out. You know, Josh Bowe had, a, had an article out, basically four major questions that he wants to see answered during this key stretch. And then our guy, uh, Iztok, uh, if, if you don't read Iztok Franco, he, he's Slovenian, so he's asleep right now, so he can't ever do these. But he's been writing some really, really astute analysis about what he's seeing and then contextualizing it. I am really, I, you know, before I had my son, I was actually very smart, but since I've, I've, I've been a, a parent, I am like constantly operating at like 20%. <laughs> and, and his talk like, reminds me of, of the ways that I wish I could write in the sense that he looks at data, he looks at what's happening on the floor. And then he says, this is what either is or isn't happening. And here's why. And so uh, I'm not sure if you guys are familiar with the article, but, but essentially Porzingis is playing much better with Luca this year. And then without Luca, he might as well be a seven foot three corpse. And it's been very interesting that last year that was not the case where he was actually very effective, uh, particularly, you know, starting kind of mid December ish, whenever, you know, and then when he came back from his long knee injury, uh, the night that Dwight Powell got hurt on like January 20th of 2020, Porzingis has really picked up the picked up the pace the rest of that that year, and that was re- really when he started to look outstanding. This year, he just hasn't had it. It's not to say he won't have it offensively, but it's it's very it's just kind of odd because that that Porzingis has always been such a a at least a a a player that commands a lot of attention, and this year when he's out there without another big time facilitator, he's not been fantastic. Um, <laughs> Alan Cockrell in the chat says, can I interest any Mavs fans in a recently healthy Justice Winslow? That guy had some rough field goal attempts tonight, Alan. That was, uh, that was something else. Um, we had some person, I it, can't see the name, but it says, I feel like was, uh, our defense was a lot better without Chris Depp Porzingis today. The hater in me 1000% agrees. The r- person who understands at least from a, like a, a, what do you want to call it? Philosophical level and understands what the Mavericks have been trying to build. I, they need KP. They rely on KP. It's that KP hasn't been doing it. And then I think the communication paired with sort of new, a lot of newness, they really, you know, training camp got, gets thrown out the window when Porzingis isn't really there. And then they all have COVID. I don't know. I, I, you guys know me. I'm the grumpiest man imaginable when it comes to the Mavericks. And I'm just, feeling kind of you know all things considered they're one game below 500 this is not terrible this is sort of what what you know in terms of when you know they won that nuggets game everybody was so excited and then the next day all the covid stuff happened 
and then it just hasn't really looked. You know, Luca had a couple of really big games. Uh, Porzingis had the really big game against uh, New Orleans. But me, in the back of my head, I've always been very concerned uh, about what's coming. And following that break, following a little bit of what we see tonight, where they won a game in the muck, where, I mean, this was an ugly game. We talked about that a few minutes ago, a few people, if, if some of y'all are just joining. Um, it's, it's really something to, to see. Uh, well, guys, I should go. I think I'm going to try to do this a little more often um, just during the week. I might tag this conversation on the back end of our podcast, depending on how long Josh and I's podcasts go. I don't know about you, but I value my, my podcast time. And so when like a podcast goes on for like an hour and 15 minutes, when it can be like an hour, it drives me crazy. So maybe I won't, but uh, if, if anybody wants to, you know, shoot me questions, you know, follow me on social, send me emails. I'm actually fairly responsive, even though I shouldn't be because I do have a different job as a database manager, but as uh, always, thanks for joining me. This has been uh, Mavs Moneyball live and we will. uh, Bye.